good evening hi good I'm, evening how are you samir i'm here how are you i'm good 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 everything okay yeah yeah all good finished your clinic today or still no, busy no uh, uh, you know the this is what they are following is uh, we have to admit the patient uh, 10 days before surgery so the guidelines say that uh, do a covid test on admission discharge him home quarantine come back after 7 days and then operate so oh my god so 10 days before surgery you have to admit the patient no admit uh, and he comes in the opd i see in yeah. the so at the moment as you know the patients sometimes you know they get uh, kind of you know they just want not to get operated and this becomes another excuse so oh i see okay and rightly so i think people don't want to come in the hospital at this stage you know the hospitals are running to one third like i mean the private setup it's uh, oh like how is the hospital coping financially because it must so be a huge they are uh, in very loss, bad mess. very bad mess you think you think they will go under any hospital will go under uh, this time they had to pay the salary of their full timers they had to take yeah. a, they had to take a loan from the banks really oh yeah. my god very difficult yeah yeah that's the reason you know the practice is going to change in india it is not yeah. going to be the same so that's why i know yeah. an institutional practice is so important now and that's the reason why you know i'm trying to make moves very fast so sure, so sure. but but uh, with institutional practice also you know now they, they can't uh, they can't offer you a salary for sure you know it is at their whims and fancies because i heard in medanta they have cut everybody's salaries yeah yeah no institution yeah. like you know uh, you know a setup where you will get good patients and which is not like the super private domain you know what i mean like semi private sure. or stratas or you know over yeah. i'm trying to Look yeah. at options overseas. It's impossible here. I think and, overseas uh, is a good option, actually. Overseas is a more stable option. The thing is, I'm telling you, the way our system is, you know, they have not even consulted epidemiologists to stay up for national guidelines. It's such a chaos. Yeah, it's terrible, terrible, actually. Yeah. So UK is doing UK is doing pretty well in that aspect. We have got, uh, you know, a lot of a uh, lot of epidemiologists and everybody involved. So. people are you know it's a very scientific basis of management for yeah. sure and did you see that that the lancet paper which criticized uh, use of uh, this uh, hydroxychloroquine is under fire now yeah they are they are looking at that lancet paper there is a lot of political mileage behind mileage, it as well yeah. you see so we don't know see t- today in fact not today yesterday morning i was in uh, i am uh, part of the india uk collaboration for uh, covid 19 i'm i'm one of the board members in that so we had a meeting with the government of india and uh, they are trying to get some ayurvedic preparations into the uk and its studies and all that so the problem is the hydroxychloroquine it's uh, hydroxychloroquine has taken such a bad uh, knocking because of that lancet paper that india is struggling because india banked heavily on hcg hmm. and almost all the data that came out of india after the covid actually used hydroxychloroquine as one of the arms and uh, used other drugs as as the separate arms so there is a big problem yesterday we had a huge discussion we had these uh, you know the department of health was online and uh, the uk department of health was online and it was all crazy actually <laughs> they initially started uh, toying with the idea of giving this homeopathy so many yeah. people uh, have taken that arsenica album without That's any also, yeah you don't know, know the outcomes yeah and the thing is you know there are big names who are manufacturing it and promoting it so yeah, many lot. people ended up taking it <clears throat> it's a craze yeah it is it is but i i think arsenica is not uh, proven and it has got side effects as well yes that is what they said in uh, large doses it can it yeah, arsenic it is a poison is, yeah it is a poison <laughs> it's a quite a quite a toxic poison actually so anyway, these guys are trying to push uh, ayurveda drugs now we don't know what is the efficacy but let's see we'll try and find out because india has got a very big uh, ministry ayush ministry I know, I know. One of my uh, friends was is working there, 
and she I tells see. me that it's a chaos because uh, the people yeah. who are sitting at the helm know nothing yeah, that is true that is true i i felt that yesterday when i was in the meeting uh, it was just crazy um i'll connect you to one person who is uh, running a organization called indo us emergency physicians uh, organization so oh, i'll just connect you to him and then yeah sure it'll be good to know probably yeah. there would be some uh, uh, he's the president of that so he developed it is based in florida i'll connect you to him i'll, I'll pass yeah, on the... it'll be good to know it'll be good to know what is happening yeah and where we we are getting a lot of feedbacks uh, on covid 19 and i'm trying to coordinate the activity between the various health departments sure uh, i'll put on to him maybe yeah, it'll be good we can we'll to know what is the outcome yeah, sure sure yeah. we can i can ask him to get you to address the forum on saturday if you are yeah, free yeah it'll be good yeah, yeah, yeah it'll, it'll be good to it. know what exactly it's happening we've just had one paper published and a second paper has just been accepted on uh, on in asia what is happening with covid so uh, you know and then uh, this this is a member of parliament uh, committee on on uh, trying to set up uh, covid protocols and they're looking at india and the problem is you guys have very low mortality that is the key thing and so everybody sort of figuring wondering why the mortality is low is it, is it genuinely it because, low uh, or is it reporting is low we don't know that i think it is uh, both uh, one is uh, i mean some people are saying about uh, the virulence of the virus in india so sure, we don't know whether it's a different virus uh, yeah. they are saying is whether uh, being exposed to such a uh, such a thing like you know primary tubercular complex whether that is yeah, the cause don't of know. maybe maybe that could be the cause so we've got harish now harish has just joined us so let me just help harish set up sure, his sure, sure. Uh, carry on presentation give me a second no, harish no. Hi, good evening good evening harish are you are you with us uh, uh you'll have to start your audio harish I, uh, and then we can hear you there you go okay now can you hear me good evening yeah we can hear you harish that's good and uh, i will give you the hosting rights for a second and then what i want you to do is start sharing your screen gotcha. and then that way uh, we will uh, get you started and then i'll take over the hosting rights because then i can moderate who's coming in and out so sure. you're not disturbed So yeah. now you got the hosting right so just share your desktop please okay wait uh, let me just continue share screen at the bottom there is a sign green sign called a share screen just uh, hold on a second I'm just trying to sort out my bluetooth yeah okay take your time don't worry can you hear me uh, yeah i can hear you very well okay perfect sorry my bluetooth was uh, okay now i'll share the screen now airports airports my boy airports yeah i've got i've got uh, some other ones here right. okay so so go, go into uh, powerpoint yeah can uh, you see my screen it. i'm sure yes we can yes we can and now what i'm going to do is i'll reclaim the host so that i can then admit people and all that you're not disturbed sure. Sure, so then you focus on your talk and then we will uh, just get you talking how are things in singapore everything okay Oh, we're we're kicking back up. Uh, we're reopening our theaters to full, um, uh huh, a uh, full active duty, I would say. Uh, and uh, I think by fifteenth of um, June, we'll go to just back to to, to full active. They're starting to allow visitors to come back into the hospital. Oh, really? Uh, they're okay. Limiting the amount of uh, visitors, but uh, they are, last time they couldn't come in at all unless the patients are uh, terminally ill or something. But now they have started as of yesterday. um visitors and stuff um so uh, oh, i think things are opening up i will see it's are a, you are you going to the hospital regularly or are you, are you still restricted yeah yeah yeah. yeah yeah i uh, you know for us we actually sort of never stop because cancer kept on going on okay uh uh-huh. so they, they never stop the cancer surgery what sort of work is going on how many cases are you doing a week uh maybe about four cases a week is uh, the average okay. for me um okay. maybe the whole division maybe about eight cases a week um so this includes so we 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 stuck to cancer surgeries that means um, lung cancers and mets um and then of course the the semi urgent cases like all the decots uh, and the pneumothorax or trauma that continues uh, so the only thing actually that we actually stopped was all the chymomas and the um the really benign lesions bronchiac sure. and things like that 
Is is Agustin still with you or he's gone full time? No, 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 no. He's full time in Mount. He's full time in Mount Salisbury. Yes, yes. Right? Yeah, yeah. But does he do any any uh, government's uh, no, 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 no attachment or something? No, no. He he was with us until 2017, if I'm not mistaken. I see. Uh, so then, now uh, he's. Yeah. So he must be he must be pretty busy, isn't he? He's got good good good. He is. He is. He is. He has a very good practice. Yeah. A good guy. I, I was trying mm. to get in touch with him to get him to lecture on this series, but I couldn't uh, uh, get across to him. I don't know. Maybe he's been very busy or something. He, he's, he's a really good uh, mentor and he gives very good talks. I think. Uh, excellent. excellent, excellent. Talks. He's just one of the best guys yeah. I've met. Yeah. And good fun. Yeah. And I, I love his talk on bronchoplasty. So I wanted him to give yes. a talk on bronchoplasty. Yeah, if you want, I can try to get in uh, touch with him. Uh, with you guys, maybe I don't know if you've got the right number. You can can you, him yeah, can you can you speak yeah. to him? Tell him Zamir is asking to speak to him, and I, sure. I maybe I have his old number. I tried to send a message to him, but I may have sent it on an old number. Sure, so I, 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 I can WhatsApp you his his number. And then... Yeah, if you can give me his new number and his email, I will get in touch with him, and then sure, that'll be great. Okay, so I think we are ready to go. It's uh, three thirty. Uh, let me just submit everybody and start the recording first, most important uh, record on this computer. Okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to another session of Thoracic Gurus. Uh, really, really proud to announce that today is our 70th lecture of the series. Uh, I didn't even know that there were 70 topics in thoracic surgery, <laughs> but uh, I think we've done very well. Uh, and I think uh, uh, Dr. Mitran, you will be uh, hour 149 and hour 150. <laughs> you have well, the pleasure okay. of, of, of yeah. uh, doing the one and a half century for us. <laughs> uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you so, very much. Uh, I, it's, it's such a pleasure to introduce uh, Harish again with us. Uh, as you all know, Harish Mitran is, is a consultant thoracic surgeon at uh, National University of Singapore, a dynamic young surgeon doing uh, very exciting work, uh, doing a lot of chest wall surgeries, a lot of VAT surgeries, and he is involved with us in the uh, on the Asian platform for teaching VATS uh, across the various countries in Asia. Uh, welcome once again, Harish, and we're looking forward to your talk on complications, uh, post-operative complications and their management. Uh, take over, take it away, it's all yours. Thank, thank you very much, Dr. Khan. It's a pleasure to be back here to uh, give this talk. Um, so when I uh, uh, took this topic on uh, with Dr. Khan, I, I, I went through it and I went, oh my God, this is going to be like a 500, um, slide presentation. So I thought maybe uh, I, I could break it down and, and go to things that we actually generally really, really, really see a lot in our, in our practice. Yeah. And it generally comes down to two or three main complications that we always deal with. And, and uh, I think you've come up with, uh, you've, you've, there have been many talks on post-operative air leaks, uh, complications like empyema, bleeding, and a lot of theory behind that. So I, I wanted to go more on a clinical uh, level with a bit of evidence and also I wanted to show you know what I've been through and how I've dealt with uh, it in, in the future some interesting cases that I put up there um, you know uh, was uh, difficult to manage um, and I wanted to just share it with everybody else so I wanted to start with uh, Isaac Asmenov who is a professor in biochem he passed away I think in 1992 I looked it up and he said this nice thing life is pleasant death is peaceful it's the transition that is troublesome. And, and really, when we do surgery journey, most of the time, it's straightforward. But we definitely encounter a lot of mid-ground complications. And it's not how we're going to take it from there and deal with it. So I looked, uh, decided to just focus on uh, uh, lung resection. And also on top of that, focus on uh, complications of lung resection. Just focus on a certain uh, few areas that I'll go into. But before that, the most important thing is, uh, you know, management of a patient is actually preventing these occurrence and we have to optimize them. And, and, and one of the main things is that when we see patients and we, we, we think that, okay, how do we deal with this? It's going to be a complicated patient or not. It's actually looking at their pre-op selection. And one very important thing is that we do the basic workup and we thoroughly screen them. And it's very important for all surgeons before we get in there, we get them to do a lung function test. Uh, and if the lung function is not very good, we get them to do exercise testing. And if they're in the borderline level, and most of them are usually, at least in my practice where I see they are generally very chronic smokers and stuff, we 
you know, if they're borderline and we know we can do curative resection for them, uh, we tend, tend to be very aggressive with our primary rehabilitation for them. And, um, and we need to optimize them very well. Of course, cigarette smoking, you tell them generally to stop, but I think about 90% of them don't. Um, uh, but you, you still must encourage them, get them on patches, uh, get them to see the, uh, put them in the uh, smoking cessation clinic and go from there. And um, you know, you got to look at them. And again, most of these people that come to us generally have some sort of diabetes, hypertension, uh, and they need to be op managed optimally over there. Get that the initial level up. In Singapore, generally, most of them are quite well nourished over here. Uh, but the cases that we see that are very malnourished, we get make sure they, we get them uh, get the nutrition up. And again, it comes hand in hand most of the time. Lung lung issues. Uh, they generally some of them have, or most of them, I'd say maybe the fifty percent have some sort of cardiac issue. And you need to really really evaluate their cardiac status because this is one of the main causes of the morbidity at the end, mortality morbidity. Uh, post lung resection. So in TROP, of course, when we're dealing with these patients, you've got to be very meticulous and I'll come to that later. And post-op, what's very important, and this is an area in thoracic surgery that we know will improve the outcomes in patients, is very good adequate control. Uh, a lot of patients basically say that, oh, uh, it's, it's painful, but I can, um, you know, don't need to take pain medicine. And this is the point where we say that it doesn't matter if it's painful or not, you need to go on a regular analgesic level. This will help with your breathing and the pain post off and the outcomes are much better. You can always take it off at a, at a later date where they're much better. So in my setup, basically before I see, or when I see a patient in clinic and when we're planning lung resection, I ensure that the CT scans that I see are not more than three months old. If they're older than that, then we will get a new CT scan for them because Things can change inside, uh, tumors can grow, and that will really, really, you have good uh, post uh, pre operative planning. It's very important with a CT scan. When they come to see me and I talk to them about any lung resection, I generally go through a standardized approach with everybody. You know, I always tell them there's always risk of bleeding. We generally do about 80% of our work by vets, but that doesn't mean that the 80% is, uh, there is a, there's also a conversion rate, and I think about 20% of that group tend to be converted. And I always tell them there's always a risk of bleeding or severe adhesions in there, and there's always just an open thoracotomy. There's always risk of infection, pneumonia, wound infection. They can get post-operative empyema. Air leaks are very common with them, uh, and we must tell them that you must expect there is some risk of air leak and prolonged air leak. Uh, Post-op pain, they can get chronic pain, and of course, risk of reoperation for any of the three main points of health. On, on, one week before surgery, usually I'll send them to do a complete blood test and see the, see the patient be seen by the anesthetist in the anesthesia clinic. They get a chest x-ray and ECG. They do their lung function test again one more time if it's not done already. And Jenny, for most patients above 50 years old who are smokers, I Jenny do a standardized cardiac assessment for them. I get an echo and I usually do a dobutamine stress test or perfusion stress test for them because you can actually pick up some sort of heart disease and you don't want to be caught up um, post-operatively of them having an MI or intraoperatively having an MI. So it's important to get them to be worked up. So on the day of the operation, usually we fast them for six hours before the surgery. And we do, we don't, and we used to, I think a few years ago, we used to admit them uh, a day before just to monitor, but we found out that's not optimum. So we just admit them on the day of the surgery in the morning, and then uh, they go in for the surgery. So post-operative, they come out. All my patients generally go on, I don't put them on suction. I, I use the uh, medulla, the topaz system. And all the patients basically, minus eight is like what we call a gravity mode. Uh, and we put them all in gravity mode, whatever, whether they do a low or whether they do a normal wedge or a segment. Uh, unless they had significant bleeding in drop or they went for a decortication surgery, then we put them on some suction on day one. And then on day two, we put it back down to gravity mode. After the surgery, they go to the recovery bay, they get a chest x-ray, and then uh, they go either to back to the ward or if we're not very sure, they're not doing too well, we send them to the high dependency. Uh, the next morning, basically, we put them on a soft diet, sit them out a bit, we ambulate them, and get them to do a chest physio. And also along with that, we do the pre uh, the, the, the post-op day one chest x-ray and bloods. So now with the drain management, basically, if the drains uh, have no air leak, if the output is under 300 mils from time of op uh, until the next morning when we review them, the color is light hemoserous or even serous, and they ambulate and the chest x-ray look good. 
and it's fine, we should just take the chest tube out and we repeat an x-ray four hours later. If it's okay, we can discharge them. These are for all the simple wedge resections and stuff. And if those, we follow the same routine, but if we do a lobectomy or segmentectomy, uh, we will actually just keep them in for one more day just to observe them, get them to ambulate, make sure they're okay with the physiotherapist. And we do a chest x-ray on post-op day two, and if they're all right, we send them home. So coming down now, so that's what we do basically, and that's what we, we have done to mitigate uh, any post-op complications and, and, and uh, handle them accordingly then. So if any of those things are not good post-operatively, we'll come to managing them. So what are the most common things uh, we have to deal with in, in um, the mobility, basically, or the complications. Jenny, most of the time, we can categorize into three main groups. Either it's a technical thing, usually bleeding, or the staple line opened up, or it didn't suture the, the lung properly when it was leaking. Uh, they can get pulmonary um, complications like pulmonary embolism, or they can even get a pneumonia, and of course, cardiovascular in nature. Now, um, as you can see here, I think these are the list over here bronchopleural and bleeding causes and miscellaneous causes. And there are many, many, many causes. And literally, if you were to talk on each one of this, again, like I mentioned, you can probably talk 30 slides on each of it. Uh, but I'm actually going to mainly focus on, on the bleeding aspect and the, and the air leak aspect. But before we go to that, and one thing very important and is that we need to actually talk to patients and let them know about mortality. Whatever we do, there is always a risk of mortality. Um, the risks are low and I always tell my patients like, you know, even if you get into a car and you drive, there's always risk that something can happen and uh, an accident can happen and you may not make it through your journey. So even then with any surgery we do, especially lung surgery, I always tell them there's always a risk of mortality, but the mortality risk is low. And if they were to have a mortality risk, most of the time if you deal with intraoperative, uh, it's mainly severe bleeding from the PA there. Uh, but Post-op journey, most of the time, they're either cardiovascular and pulmonary in nature. But these, basically, these risks of mortality for our lung surgery patients only have really, really decreased over these years. And again, like I mentioned in my previous slides, it's really improvement because of our pre-operative selection. We really do a proper workout for these patients and we select patients very well. We have very meticulous intraoperative techniques right now. And of course, we have improved our post-operative care significantly. Now, if you look at uh, studies from 1961 all the way down to 2004, so about 40, 40 years, 45 years plus, and if you look at lobectomy and pneumonectomy over here, you can see that you know, the risk of mortality back then was very high, about 10%. And over time, it's really, really, oops, sorry, over time, it's really, really, really come down to a lot. And, um, and, and this is, again, because of the three factors I mentioned earlier. So uh, from the BTS, um, uh, guideline 2010, they generally say that the risk of mortality on average, 3 day mortality for lobectomy is about 2.3% and about 5.8% for a pneumonectomy. So the pneumonectomy rates are definitely higher. We all know that there are many other, many causes for it. And I think that we all kind of know uh, from any theory that right side pneumonectomies is always have a higher risk than compared to the left side pneumonectomies. And if you're doing an extrapural pneumonectomy, because this is a much more very um, uh, difficult operation, the risk uh, can go up to almost 11%. In 2007, published in Thorax, basically, they looked at over 4,000 of our patients. And uh, you can see they looked at um, mortality for 30 days, and they looked at low, for development for women and men. They look at lobectomy and subclavar resection, bilobes and pneumonectomies. And if you look at here, the under 70 years old group for, for females, uh, literally under 1% here, yeah, and for males are probably under 2%. And of course, if you do a bilobectomy, the numbers for females increase by up to 4%, and for males go up to about 6.9% for under 70 years old. And if you look at if they're older, the number kind of almost doubles, almost triples, isn't it, uh, over here in terms of percentage of death, of dying from the, the surgery. And we can definitely attribute this to probably the older people have many other comorbids along with it. Of course, if you're doing your monectomy, it's a much larger surgery. And definitely without a doubt, probably the tumor is more aggressive. If you're doing a monectomy for them or the disease in the lung is much more worse. So there are many other factors that go along with it. But the risk also is, can be as high as 17% in the elderly female and almost up 21% in the elderly male. 
Uh, in the US, uh, they then looked at things like if you do, uh, um, you know, people are all going and doing vets nowadays, everyone's just uh, doing a lot of vet surgery. So they wanted to actually look like, okay, if you do a vet surgery versus a thoracotomy um, for lobectomies, uh, is there actually a, a change or is there a decrease or an increase uh, in the mortality rate? So this is published in 2017 in the Annals of American Thoracic Society. They looked at uh, patients from 2009 to 2012, and over 27,000 patients underwent lobectomy in the United States. And, uh, you know, even up to 2017 in the U.S., you can see the numbers, 35% only actually had bad surgery, and most of them actually had thoracotomies. And then they matched them, 9,000 were matched. And clearly in the match pair group, you can see that the mortality risk of un people undergoing uh, bad lobectomies were much less almost half than, um, than that of if you do the thoracotomy. Uh, we all know they have shorter length of stay and basically even the complications of doing a bad surgery was much lower than that if, when they do a thoracotomy. So one of the, the main things I'm gonna talk about in this talk actually is I'm gonna focus on, on bleeding, on air leaks, persistent space, or persistent space first, followed by air leaks, and then empyema I didn't wanna go into because that's a really broad topic and we talk about DPF and stuff, so I left that out. But if you look at the major complications, like I mentioned to you earlier, and, and what I always counsel my patients is, we always talk about bleeding, addicts, and empyema. These are the most common things we deal with. So post-operative bleeding now, literally actually post-op bleeding in, in for lung resections is actually very, very uncommon. And what's the actual number? For thoracotomies, it's actually 0.1 to about 3% of these patients and under 2% for bad uh, surgery. And even then in this group, if you need to re-explore them, they're actually you know, only under 2% of any pulmonary resection that we do for if they have thoracotomy, and literally only 1% um, uh, if we do it by bats. And you know, what, what's the most common thing that causes actually journey? Patients who undergo surgery from the data out there says that almost 25 of, of them are taking some sort of medically prescribed anticoagulation either aspirin, flavix, or they're on warfarin, or some sort of blood thinner. And this really can contribute to, to the post-operative bleeding. Another big thing, actually, and for me, this is a very common, and we've learned it the hard way, especially when we're doing cardiac, uh, when I used to do cardiac back in the day, is that a lot of people um, take herbal medicine. And in America, 40% of them take herbal medicine. And about 50%, I'm pretty sure about more than 50% of the Asian population take medicine, uh, take herbal medicine. And the herbal medicine may not just be tablets. A lot of them come in like herbal soup or a very famous bakute soup or herbal soup or, you know, some sort of thing, bird's nest that they take. And very commonly also nowadays, you can see ginkgo. I'm sure this is everywhere right now. Uh, ginkgo is for weight loss and things. And if you look at some of the herbs, ginkgo, uh, biloba, ginseng, so palmetto, the people take this for liver, and all these things actually can cause platelet dysfunction. And you're sometimes wondering, you don't talk to your patients, you don't tell them, stop this. They, they think it's normal and it's natural, they take it. And when you're doing the surgery, you notice, wow, why is this guy so oozy? You know, and then when you go back and take a proper history again, you find out, oh my gosh, they've been taking these, uh, these uh, herbal medications. So you, you need to always check them. So if they're I always ask this question, if you're taking any herbal meds or taking any sort of supplement or even in their food, uh, like soups or that they eat, I always say, stop all this for at least two weeks. Um, if they if they are taking warfarin, I usually stop the warfarin for five days, I check their INR. And in, 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 if the INR exceeds more than 1.5, I generally get some uh, FFP standby. If it's very high, 2.0 or something, I don't proceed for surgery, I wait it out uh, until it comes down to under 1.5. Uh, those who are taking aspirin and Plavix, if we can discontinue it, we tell them to stop it completely for at least seven days. And uh, But those, some patients who have stents, and, and those who have stents under a year, journey, I will talk to my cardiologist, and usually I will operate with these patients with just aspirin, but not with Plavix. Um, there are a lot of stents nowadays um, that actually only need DAPT for six weeks, and then you can change it over just to aspirin, and then I think you can actually perform operations safely, just be a bit more meticulous and, and uh, you can actually do the surgery with aspirin on board. Uh, of course, uh, chemo, we know chemo and RT has always high risk of bleeding and uh, 
three exploratory rates in the data is about 0.7 up to about 1.5%. So, you know, what do we do? So say you, you've done the, the vet lobectomy or thoracotomy and your patient goes back to the high D or is in the ward and then suddenly you see like one liter of fluid comes out in one hour. Really, you shouldn't sit and wait. I think you should just take the patient back and explore because having a one liter bleed straight away is something very catastrophic for the patient's hemodynamics. Um, and then if you observe this patient and they're you know, having bleeds 200 mils every hour for about two to four hours, you should also go back and take a look at this patient. And of course, if you suddenly see a sudden output of 400 mils of fresh blood coming out, go back and take a look. And of course, if you get an x-ray like this post-op, you know, I don't think there's anything to correct anymore. You should just always go back and, and re-explore the patient and, and, and see what to do. So when you're going to take the patient back, I think always anticipate the worst. I mean, the odds of a pulmonary artery opening up is very, very rare uh, with staplers. But I uh, notice some people use silk ties or clips and these can slip and they can cause a lot of bad bleeding. So you always anticipate the words, get four to six units of fat cells. I think the rest are more needful. for like, if, if, if you have some derangement in, in uh, the blood levels, you should uh, get, get all the platelets, uh, FFP and, and prior ready if, if you feel any of the other levels are deranged. So interactive approach, when you go back in, Jenny, if from history, if they actually have bleed, the risk of death is almost up to about 10%, but I think these levels are much lower now. Um, and Jenny, most of the bleeding areas can, can come from, um, just, just give me a minute, sorry. Just... Ah, sorry. Hold on, my Siri is being activated. Just give me a minute, sorry for that. Okay, yeah, where were we? Uh, yeah, so, so bleeding basically can come from uh, mainly like mediastinal or bronchial vessels, and those can bleed, so about 23% of them. Intercostal vessels, now if you do a thoracotomy and you don't secure the intercostal vessels well, they actually can bleed from over there. Uh, I, my, the, the, my previous bosses always used to teach me and said, oh, you need to put a, a tie around the, um, the rib and, and secure it tight or make sure you catch the, the intercostal and tie tight. But I, I, I've actually stopped doing that and I actually really just use a diatomy to burn it thoroughly if I feel it's bleeding. And so far that's worked, but I think you must be very meticulous here. Um, bleeding from pulmonary vessels can be very catastrophic. They account for about 17% right now. And of course, no specific side of bleeding. You have, you know, this is very, very common. You go in there, you check everything, and you find out that the bleeding has stopped, and that's about 41% of them. So again, evaluate properly, check the intercostals, check the bronchial vessels, check the lung parenchyma, and then um, look at the lymphatic beds. And lymphatic beds, or when you do ex especially extensive dissection, they can actually lose, especially if you're just doing it with a hooked diatomy. Um, I think the risk of it bleeding uh, with a harmonic uh, or, a, or a ligature is probably less, uh, but I don't have the evidence behind that, but um, I'm pretty sure it has a probably better sealant level. Uh, we know if it's coming from the pulmonary vessels, again, I'd say it's very catastrophic. And you need to check all the staple line, check everything. If it's bleeding on the staple line, you can always put an extra clip there, or you can even put a, a stitch on it. Uh, so when you actually need to re-explore sometimes and if you feel the patient's sort of stable, you can actually go back in through a VATS way. And, and I think many surgeons are doing that now. But if you feel the patient's really unstable, then I think you need to go in and do a, a thoracotomy. So I don't have videos of post-op bleeding for me going in there, but I want to show you these are the things that you can encounter intra-op. And uh, this is from a hook diatomy, uh, what we're trying to... What we're trying to um, Sorry, sorry. Well, we're trying to hook the uh, fascia of the uh, artery. We end up burning the um, uh, branch of the truncus. And you can see, so we need to get around it. Um, you see it's actively, this is very, actually on the scope, on the bad scope, it looks like, oh my God, it's really big, but it's actually a very, very, very small hole. And uh, so once you go around the vessel, um, uh, you can actually still put a sucker there to compress it temporarily. And I and for this particular case, I could actually just pass the stapler through and and uh, and staple it. But what happened was uh, after we stapled it, um, uh, well, you can see right now. After we stapled it, it, it still continued to have a small spurt there, and you can just use a clip to um, 
to, to just to stop the bleeding straight away. And I think that that does its good job very well. And uh, here we go. You can see that thing is still um, um, uh, spurting away. And so you can just put a clip, and then once you put the clip in there, you can just continue with your 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 lumpectomy. Right, and this is another one doing a lobectomy. And um, if you, I mean, what I'm trying to lead to is that these are what things you do in trial. But if you come back in and you have a ooze from the PA, uh, you uh, you can see it's very small, small ooze initially. But I'll just jump uh, jump a little bit. You just put some pressure. And I always tell people when you have a pulmonary artery uh, bleed, there's always uh, four things you need to do. The first thing you do is put pressure. Uh, get your poise, um, uh, be patient, and the last one is uh, the fourth piece, always uh, pray. Um, but um, I think the praying part, uh, you do while you're pressing. So here's one um, thing where we're just compressing it, uh, and after compressing it, it's still, still, you know, oozing away. And again, we can see this purely because of a, of just a, a hook diatomy or, or a burn to the pulmonary artery. It's a very small bleed. And you can control it. So what we did was we put a tackle seal. And I want to just show you how sometimes tackle seals are, you know, they crumble so easily and it's so difficult. And you can see it's all over the shop. So once you get it right and you put it in there uh, and you hold it steadily, uh, you then get a wet gauze and you put it over and compress it. And, and literally you need to just compress it over, over uh, a few minutes. And eventually, I'm just, I, I just showed the longer video of how long we were compressing it uh, for, but eventually it will look something like this when you take it out. So, so tackle seals are good to, if like pre or post operatively, if any ooze or something, you can actually put a tackle seal over it. But the best thing to do is always either a clip or a stitch uh, if it's small. Um, so, I'm coming to my case presentations of, uh, of bleedings that I've encountered uh, from very simple bleeds to some difficult cases. And uh, I wanted to show you guys what I've encountered. So this is a young male with a spontaneous pneumothorax and had a second episode of a pneumothorax. So that's an indication for surgery. So we did a uh, bullectomy for him, did a bad bullectomy, and we did a pleurectomy where we peeled the uh, parietal pleural uh, layer off. And uh, we hope that will then uh, create bridging fibrosis between the lung and the um, uh, and the and the chest wall. So you can see post op. Actually, everything looked good, but retrospectively, looking back, you know, there's a bit more haziness and shadowing here. But we thought, okay, it's fine. Uh, the issue with him is that he didn't have any catastrophic bleed, and he was actually hemodynamically very well. HB didn't drop very much at all, but he always had this very, very dark, bloody output, and it was about 100 mil a day on post-op day two. Post-op day three was still about 100 mils a day, but you can see the x-ray is getting worse and worse right now. So over here, you get more hematoma formation and you can see the haziness of the lung is gradually getting more. So which kind of lets me know that there's probably some blood collecting posteriorly. And so he had to earn his surgery and this is very clear. This is on day of the op 13.2 and then till post-op day four, he dropped three points in total. So we took him back, we did a bath, we evacuated the hematoma and, you know, again, no actual bleeding site at all. So we, what I'm trying to tell, um, and this is the final x-ray um, a few weeks later. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that even though the ooze is very little and maybe just 100 mils a day, I think it's important that maybe you don't need to take him back. Maybe these things will stop by themselves. But if they continue to persist and you see a constant hemoglobin drop, then I think that is definitely an indication to go, to go back in. Uh, this is one of my most difficult um, cases I actually did, uh, or most difficult complications I had to deal with post-operatively. And uh, a lot of the, the case studies that I'm going to show you is actually what happened to me in my first two years of practice. Of course, I still get complications, but I've learned from these. And, and uh, I'll point out to you a few mistakes I've done along the way. So case two is, I always call it the case of a recurrent whiteout lung. So we had a 69-year-old male diabetic hypertensive. He was a smoker. And he had a big uh, right upper lobe mass and was involving the second and third rib and also the, the right middle lobe. Uh, had a CT guard biopsy, was an adeno CA, had a PET scan, everything looked fine except for the mass. And we put him through an EBUS, uh, the biopsy, the lymph nodes, and they were all negative. 
I think even a 70% DLC was not very good at 51%, but we felt that we could put it through the tumor board and we could go for curative uh, lung resection for him. So we did a right thoracotomy. We resected the second and third ribs and the right upper and middle lobe, took out the lymph nodes. And of course, you, I'm even asking myself this question of why I reconstructed the third rib. The sixth rib, we actually fractured when we, um, when we retracted the rib. So we thought, okay, we'll fix it since we open up the set. So here we go. Okay, so uh, what we did, this is the intro of findings. Um, we fractured the sixth rib, so we stabilized the matrix rib. And again, I will question myself today on why you need to fix the third rib because I've spoken about chest wall reconstruction and you don't need to actually fix the third rib if you're just resecting that. So this is the post-op x-ray. And, you know, he did really well. He went back to the Heidi the next morning. He, uh, this is his post-op day one x-ray. He had his breakfast and the ICU team was so confident they sent him up to the general ward in the evening. But when I went to see him in the morning the next day, he was very tachypnic and, uh, you know, he didn't look too well. And uh, we did his bloods and this is the x-ray. You can see here there's a lot of opacities within the resected lung. Uh, the hematorics of the resected lung. But one thing was not clear was that there was no actual hip drop in HP. And the output of the drain was very minimal and it wasn't even the bloody, bloody uh, kind of uh, drain. So we said, look, let's drop him down to the, uh, to the ICU and let's get a CT scan to see what's going on here. So if you look at the CT scan, the whole load, he's only got low load left. Think about maybe 90% of the low load is is, uh, is, is completely collapsed and there's very little effusion. And um, the, the scans high above show the bloody uh, um, uh, a mucus obstruction in, in, the, um, in the right uh, lower lobe. So we, we intubated him because he wasn't, he's very, was a bit restless. And we did a bronchoscope and we sucked out all the um, mucus. And we also found bits of rice in there. So he probably aspirated a little bit too. And uh, we after that, uh, uh, aspirating all the um, uh, secretions from the airway, the lung re-expanded and it looked okay. So he remained in high D, we extubated him the next day for sub day three, but he got reintubated again day four for acidosis. And then we extubated him on day six. And throughout this time, the x-ray was looking very, very fine. So on post-op day seven, we go to see him and wide out again. And this time I'm going, okay, you know, don't tell me it's a collapse lung again, but you know, what's significant is look at this, the HP has dropped now from 10 to seven. And this again tells us something very, very clear that there is definitely a bleed uh, going on here. So we got a CT scan for him again, and you can see it's a huge hematoma over here uh, in, the, in the right hematorex. So we went in, did a re -thoracotomy. We evacuated the hemothorax, uh, hemostase, and we did a chest washout. And uh, in drop, we had 500 mils of blood clots, no obvious bleeding sites. There were some raw surfaces. But other than that, the, the PA, the stumps were all intact. And uh, we just washed up uh, thoroughly and then we put some uh, surgicel over the raw surfaces and came up. So uh, post-op, uh, again, not the best x-ray, but we, we thought, okay, look, this is the best we can do and let's, let's weigh it out. So uh, this is... Um, second day from the second surgery and uh, 10 day from the first surgery. And this is what the x-ray looked like. He was stable. We took out the other chest drain. We kept one chest drain just for observation. And we sent him up to the ward on day four of, of the second operation. And guess what happened on day four? Wide out again. <laughs> so uh, really, but, and you know, this it can't happen three times in a row. So we did a HP check again and the HP was stable. And this time, you know, I said, not got to be mucus plugging in. I didn't want to put him through another CT scan. So got the physiotherapist in, nabbed him and really patted his back out. And right after the physio, the lung re-expanded back up again. So, uh, and uh, surprisingly, when if we took out the tube, got him to walk around and we discharge him. This is what the x-ray looked like when we discharge him. So a case of uh, recurrent wide out lung is uh, one of the most difficult things I uh, had to deal with uh, in my very, in my junior time of uh, uh, being a consultant. Again, I question myself on this matrix trip here, but you know, uh, you learn from that. So, so that's about the bleedings that we deal with and my post-operative bleedings that we, how we deal with. The next area I want to talk about is that what 
we as surgeons, we uh, thoracic surgeons, we always have encountered is post lobectomy spaces. And really, you post lobectomy spaces can be many causes behind it, but mainly you have to deal with physiological air space, air leaks, and subcutaneous emphysema, and of course, um, one of the other causes is the reduced lung compliance, and that's why the lung doesn't fill the space thoroughly. So uh, again, yeah. Uh, residual space can always be an underestimated complication, but most of the time, uh, generally these persistent spaces are not actually really functionally detrimental to them. And Jenny always just a disturbing radiological finding for us surgeons. And uh, very important is treat the patient and not treat the x-rays. Well, I, I, I sent this message to my juniors because they said, oh, there's a pneumothorax up the suction, then they down the suction, then they up the suction, then down the suction, and you're not doing any justice um, uh, to yourself or, or to the patient by doing this. So don't treat the x-ray, treat the patient. So physiological residual space is actually very, very common. Uh, you know, you're, when you remove a lobe, you're taking up, if it's an upper lobe, almost about 30% of that particular lung. If you're doing a bi lobe, you're taking up 50% of that, that lung. And so it takes time for the lung to actually really, really expand and, 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 and fill up uh, that space. So if you get your chest tube in a good position and it's not blocked or it's not sitting in the fissure, eventually with time as the lung expands, the diaphragm moves up, the mesom shifts a little bit, the space will fill up. So don't worry about that. But, and this is an example here after lobectomy, you've got a physical airspace over here. And I, I never worry about it. My chest tubes are still on gravity mode and if there's no air leak we pull the tube out and literally after uh, a day or two the, the lung just re-expand again so don't worry about it and the issue you have to worry right now is air leaks now dr khan i think uh, had a beautiful uh, presentation on, on pals and uh, i went through and, and saw what he spoke about so i think i don't want to touch on the theory aspect of it but more on the clinical aspect of things so we know that uh, most of these air leaks are alveolar air leaks and they're very different from BPFs and I completely agree with Dr. Khan always uh, says a BP, an alveolar leak is not a BPF. Every time someone tells me it's a BPF, it's like a four-letter word for me you know, or three-letter word for me. I'm like, it's not a BPF, it's an alveolar leak, so don't confuse those two. And it's very important for us to actually educate our respiratory physicians whenever they say that because when we say BPF, it's, that's a whole different ballgame. I'm not going to go into that. I'm going to talk more on, on what we deal with generally most of the time. So uh, the, in the initial phase, it's always difficult to know whether, uh, well, you we sort of know if it's a small leak, you know, it's coming from the alveolar. But sometimes when we like do decortications and stuff and, and uh, there's a lot of tears and you repair as much, but because the, uh, there's still a lot of big leaks, post-op you can have leaks up to about 2,000 mils. But you know for certain this is not a BPF, and, and they generally tend to tend, tend to come down uh, uh, very quickly after that. So um, what defines actually a, a, a long air leak is actually STS defines it as more than five days. And I always wondered why actually was it five days as a as a medical as, as a resident? Why is it five days? Where you get that number? So actually, really they define it as more than five days because it exceeds average day of a normal lobectomy patient. That's what prolonged air leak actually is and why they got that number five days. And uh, if you get an air leak, of course, we know the patient stays longer and they have a lot of complications that can come with and it's associated with higher risk of morbidity, atelectasis, pneumonia, and of course, infection, empyema. All right, but please understand one thing and most air leaks always generally about 90, 95% of them stop within two to three weeks, even the worst ones, if it's an alveolar air leak. All right, so uh, again, uh, risk factors, again, I think Dr. Khan went through it, so I'm just, just gonna mention it out. But what is important uh, over here is that, is that when you do the surgery, it's very, very important to free up every adhesion uh, from, the, uh, from the lung, from the chest wall. This allows the lung to actually get mobilized. A lot of times I've seen one or two uh, people have done is that they don't free up completely because they said, oh, too much work and I have to free it up the diaphragm. But actually you're, you're, you're doing, you're not going to allow the lung then can't fill up the space if you don't free up this adhesion. So you must free up the adhesion, thoroughly, completely mobilize it off the pericardium, off the chest wall, off the diaphragm. That's very, very important. 
of course, there's high risk. Uh, we do upper and, and viral vaccines because again, the lower load takes time to fill up and go to the top and, and reach the apex of the lung. So okay, it is definitely longer. And of course, one big issue is that if you have an air leak and the lung is expanded, okay, you know it's gonna probably seal. But if you have a continuously collapsed lung and it's an ongoing air leak, and this is a, a risk factor and something that you need to, to take more, more, um, more notice of. And, and these are probably one of the main causes of it. You're gonna probably know that it's gonna be a longer uh, duration of stay for the patient or the longer duration of chest tube. Um, sorry. Um, so this paper was published in, uh, in, in ATS, sorry. Uh, by Dr. Sunil um, Singhal, and he, he looked at the number of patients who actually had um, pulmonary resections. Um, and so he reported that most of these patients, you know, 28 to about 60% of these patients actually um, have post-operative air leaks. And so on the post-op day one, right after surgery, maybe you can get up to 60%, but on post-op day one, this number tends to come down. And on day two, you can see it, it's almost down to about 25%. Most of them, again, by day four, they generally tend to seal off. Um, and uh, this is from his observational st study that he did. Um, sorry. Okay, yes. Um, so again, uh, back to it, like I mentioned to you, uh, you know, if you want to avoid these, these, these leaks and you want to get the lung to heal faster is that you've got to free up all the adhesions, mobilize the lung. If the lung has some empyema on it, um, when you're doing it, especially for infective cases, decorticate the lung, make sure the lung can actually expand, uh, free up the inferior pulmonary ligament. You can do something called pleural tenting. I'll show you a video of, uh, of a pleural tenting afterwards. Um, you can use surgical sealants, Neovil, but I'll show you another video after this that shows that these may not be the best options. There's one uh, complication that I encountered. Uh, buttress switches, and uh, of course you can use muscle flaps, which we'll talk about later. So you've, now you've come back to the, um, after you've done the resection, you've come back now to the ward, and uh, you see uh, there's bubbles in the, in, in the chest bottle. So uh, what to do next? So Robert Sofolio, again, uh, uh, Dr. Khan spoke about this. But what was the first classification on air leaks, uh, grade one, three? Uh, but uh, one thing I wanted to bring forward was something I, I discovered was um, uh, Dr. Takamochi in 2017 um, presented his data on and he graded the type of air leaks uh, with, according to the digital suction graphs. And I think most of us are actually using these digital suction graphs, and it's a really great benefit to us on how we actually. Um, uh, we can actually plan ahead and, and know whether these patients actually are going to get a prolonged air leak or not. So he graded into five grades, type A to E. And type A is, of course, normal, no air leak. You're pretty certain, and usually you can take the chest out the next day. Now, type B is a gradually decreasing air leak, and these are generally showing a healing pattern in the lung. So you can see they have a big air leak first, and you have a downward pattern. So this is a type B. A type C also is what we call intermittent where they have no air leak and suddenly they get air leak and then no air leak again. And again, this is a healing pattern. So you know these are probably gonna heal and, and settle down. But what you're gonna to have to worry is actually about the type T and type E uh, leaks. And these are the things that uh, you can probably gauge by day two, day three, really that this guy is probably gonna have a prolonged air leak. And these are the ones that it's uh, just, you know, it goes up and down, up and down, up and, down and, and doesn't resolve. In a few days and of course i think the worst one is the type e where it's uh, stable and then it spikes up again so this is definitely going to be a delayed healing and this kind of sets your mindset of how you're going to manage the patient so he if uh dr takamuchi's data basically shows that uh, type b to type e you can see that type e had the, probably the longest duration of air leak and uh the chest tube of course was placed longer one thing to look at also is the amount or the peak of the air leakages uh, that he presented here. And uh, if the peak goes up to about 400, even if it's one shot or two shots or three shots, you, you probably can expect um, longer uh, air leaks and longer duration of chest tube placement. So it's a good paper to look at. And I think, you know, uh, uh, if anybody is keen, you know, this is a good uh, paper to do a prospectively um, uh, study to just, uh, 
we affirm his results, you know, I think it's uh, something that we can look at. So you've got the patient back into the ward and you notice there's bubbles there or you see your, your graph and you see, okay, there's an air leak. And then you take an x-ray, there's a small space there and you go, okay, what to do now? Shall I put on suction? Should I put on gravity mode? You know, what, what do I do? So when you put on suction, yes, you get the lung is going to expand. It's normal because you're creating a more negative uh, pressure suction system. So the lung is going to pull open and it's going to improve the chest x-ray. So you're going to uh, improve the lung re-expansion. You're going to minimize the pleural uh, defect and we're going to feel a lot better uh, internally. But I don't know whether it's going to help the patient or not. And of course, if, like I mentioned, if you're doing a G-cot or you're doing a bleeding, you want to put on suction, I think that's, uh, that is definitely uh, warranted. So what about no suction? So no suction, basically, if you don't suck it, they always say that the, the leak won't be kept open. And so when that leak is not kept open, it can actually close together and then it will form adhesions with itself. It will seal up and then the lung can re-expand again. So I'm, I'm a fan of no suction after uh, any lung surgery. And, um, and so I, I look back at the data and wanted to see if I'm actually doing the right thing or not. And, and really the, the, the experience actually comes from the lung volume reduction experience. And uh, they are the ones who started questioning whether we should actually use suction or no suction. So this paper uh, by Cooper uh, published in a Journal of Thoracic and Cardiovascular Surgery in 1996, he had about 150 patients who underwent bilateral LBRS uh, surgery for severe emphysema. And Jenny, in his conclusion, he avoided suction for most of his patients. And he only applied suction if his post-op x-ray showed more than 30% pneumothorax, or the unlined lung appeared restricted or compressed and could not expand thoroughly because of maybe very, very bad pro compliance, or there was very bad subcute emphysema. And again, in, in, in one of his statements in his discussion, he said that only 10, 10 out of the last 50 patients actually required any type of suctioning uh, post-operatively. And if they actually still had an air leak after that, he just put them on a hemlock valve and he discharged them. Um, in in uh, thoracic clinics, uh, on complications, one of the complication topics, they looked at a few of the um, uh, uh, randomized control studies that were done. And so you can see like NES means uh, no external suction. So um, out of one, two, three, four, five, six, you can see that one, two, three, four said benefits of no suction. And they commented that they were, they were better uh, sealing, but there were some studies that said uh, better to put suction. So really I came and said, okay, so let's look at the real hard evidence. Let's go down to the meta analysis and see. So, ICTVS 2018, they looked at 10 RCTs at 1,600 over patients, and they looked at it. So this is with suction, this is no suction group. Again, most of them were not statistically significant. You can see the confidence intervals are crossing one over here, but they kind of favored non-suction. So prolonged air leak means those who, uh, it was more for the suction group that had prolonged air leak versus the non-suction group that had less prolonged air leak. Uh, of course, post-op pneumothorax, this is self-explanatory, isn't it? You put on suction, the lung fills up. So this was significant um, uh, with suction. And, um, and uh, the duration of chest tube and duration of air leak, again, the duration of uh, chest tube was more favoring. That means lesser duration on non-suction and lesser duration on air leak. But again, they were all non-significant. You look at the confidence intervals. All right. And, um, and, and the last one was the length of hospital stay. Again, non significant, but they were favoring more on the non-suction non group where they said that they had a lesser stay. So at the end of the day, the cartoon over here says that, you know, suction resulted in lower occurrence of post operative pneumothorax, but longer chest tube duration and same length of hospital stay. So really, the jury is still out. Uh, and um, so what to do? But, you know, their take home message was that suction may be as effective as simple water drainage. Uh, for post-operative chest range following on surgery. So again, um, uh, something to, to think about. So I always say, what to do lah? You know, it's a, it's a Singapore or Malaysian slang, they always say lah. And so in my practice, basically, I don't use any suction, like I said, unless, again, you have a big or symptomatic or growing pneumothorax, you're getting a lot of subcute emphysema, patient has a clinical deterioration, or patients who go for demo, yeah, have a decot, 
or patients who actually have uh, hemothorax or a lot of bloody secretion, then I want to suck it all up. So for patients that now, now they're in the ward, they're still having an air leak. And for me, it's seven days. My, my mark is seven days. Um, what I do is I put them on the hemocorp. And, uh, and I've got, uh, I think maybe about uh, more than 20, 30 patients in this past maybe uh, three years or two, two years that actually have gone back on the hemlock valve. And I'm very happy with this valve. I've, I've never had any issues uh, uh, at all with it. Uh, this is the blow off valve over here. And uh, you can, when, he, when the patient coughs, you can see that the valve will, will open up. And so uh, who do I put on? Basically, if they are small, small pneumothoraxes, they're stable, uh, they're still an air leak, and, um, and I'll put them on But before that, what we do is we check and see whether is this just a, still a, just a space that's there or is it actually really a, a pneumothorax? So if you have a digital drainage that just tells you you don't have to do this, but if you're really not sure, and, and, and the digital drainage system or the Mandela always tells us anything under 20, you can take out the tube. But I completely disagree with them because I've pulled out drains under 20 and the pneumothorax is created literally within 24 hours. So actually for me, I really need a zero number uh, to go with it. So if, if it's in that group where 10, 20, 10, 20, I'm not sure, I do the chest tube clamping method. So what I do is I do an x-ray in, in the morning, first thing in the morning, I clamp the tube. Uh, so I do an x-ray first thing in the morning, then I clamp the tube for six hours. So x-ray is actually done by 7.38. We review them at 8.30, we clamp the tube. And then we do an x-ray at 2.30 p.m. If the repeat x-ray looks good and it's fine, we'll take out the tube. But, uh, so sorry, we, we will, we will um, take out the tube. But if the x-ray doesn't look good, then we just send them home with the, with the hemlock valve. But if you're saying you've clamped the tube and, and, and the x-ray may be slightly more increased pneumothorax, you're not sure and you, use your, your, you, you know, don't want to send them back with the hemlock valve yet, I will usually keep the tube clamped overnight. The reason is that he's been clamped for six hours in the morning and in the afternoon and up to the evening. If he doesn't show any signs of deterioration, I'm pretty sure I can clamp it overnight. So I usually keep the clamp overnight and repeat an x-ray in the morning. And if it's stable, I take out the tube. If not, they go home on the hammock valve. But always do this first thing in the morning, I tell, tell uh, every, all my residents, it's because we get a very long duration to monitor them. So if there are any signs of increasing pneumothorax or clinical deterioration, then we can pick it up and unclamp the tube early. So when I send them back on the hemlock valve, uh, what do I do? I get them to see me back in the clinic a week later. Again, I get them to be always put on the first patient of the clinic day. So they come at eight o'clock in the morning, they'll get registered, and then I'll, they'll go and get a chest x-ray done. And I'll come to the clinic by nine o'clock. I'll ask them to do the cough test. And if there's no cough, I uh, will then, uh, no, no, no cough impulse on, on the hemlock valve, I will clamp the tube. Again, clamp the tube for six hours, I'll send to hang around in the clinic, and then I do an x-ray six hours later, if it's okay, I take out the tube. And so then I will get them to see me back again the following week and do another x-ray. But if they have a still an ongoing air leak, I'll just say, okay, go home, uh, come back next week and we'll do the same thing as, as uh, I mentioned earlier. Um, the longest patient I've actually ever had on hemlock valve was 21 days, and uh, and you know he was fine, got used to it. So again, um, uh, uh, Robert Sofolio had uh, he 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 looked at his uh, group of patients. He had a huge group, 199 patients uh, discharged home on the hemlock valve, uh, but you know, and he said literally he could remove most of the the tubes within a week, but. Nine of his patients actually had a persistent leak even after two weeks of management. But he said that, uh, and when I even spoke to him, he said, it's okay, he clamped the tube and uh, he, he took it out. Even if there was a slightly bigger pneumothorax, he just took the tube out and um, uh, he was uh, comfortable with it and the patients were well. So it's something that I don't dare to do, uh, but um, you know, this is the evidence out there. So uh, if you want to try that, there is at least some evidence behind it. So um, now, another thing is that, uh, which, which we deal with is that if there is still a prolonged air leak and, and you don't want to send the home or patient home on a, on a hemlock valve or you don't have that kind of thing is that what you can do is if the lung has expanded and there's a leak still there, 
you can then inject talc or tetracycline or even blood through the chest tube and that will act like a pleural disease for the patient. And I think there are many reports out there that says it's actually pretty effective uh, and it actually reduces the, the, the duration of need. Um, Dr. Khan spoke about endobronchial valves and surgical intervention. Um, after that, I have no experience using endobronchial valves, so I can't comment much on that. But for surgical intervention, when to go in uh, is actually something that you have to decide on a case-by-case -case basis. Like I mentioned, 92% of them, I mean, uh, stop within a week, and only 8% will go back on the Hamlet valve. And even those group of Hamlet valves, you can actually take out the tube after two to three weeks, they stop. But having said that, I've had patients where I had to go back in and, and hear my case presentations for a prolonged addict. So this is a lady uh, who had a GGO in the um, posterior segment of the uh, upper lobe on the right side. So we went in and we wedged it. We sent it for a frozen section. It came out as a I don't know, and uh, we decided to do a lobectomy for the patient. So this is the pre-CT scan and this is the post-op x-ray. And post-op, she had some addict and, and I'll show you the video on, on, on why, uh, why I should have done something else. But anyway, I'll, I'll talk about it after this. So post-op x-ray look okay, lung, sort of there's a space there. She had an addict, I thought it was fine. But her addict kind of persisted uh, for some time. And we did, and she wanted to stay in the ward, so we kept her in the ward. And so after two weeks, we did the clamping test, and uh, it looked good. She had a space, but we clamped it for, actually, I kept it clamped for 48 hours in, instead of her. And it sort of was stable, so I thought, okay, this is a persistent space, let's just take out the tube. So we took out the tube and discharged her. And she came back to the, to the clinic, um, sorry, that was, uh, yeah, came back to the clinic, a few times, but I just want to show you the six weeks post of x-ray showed the lung kind of coming up again. And uh, we were very happy. We said, okay, great. Uh, we'll see you back in uh, three months. But then three months later, when she comes back, uh, look at this. The lung is gone down. It's big pneumothorax over here. But surprisingly, she didn't have any hydro or usually there's a space that we fluid build up, isn't it? And then there may, maybe, might not, by now the pleural probably would have killed, but maybe there'll be like subcute if I see mine stuff. But and she was quite well, except, but, and, and, but one thing she always told me, she said, Doctor, I always feel like I got a bubbling sound inside my chest. And I think it's very important for, you, for us as surgeons to not ignore these things, but listen to the patient. But the x-ray kind of speaks for himself. And, you know, you would think, oh, is there a BPF there? And, you know, uh, you know did the stump open up? And she, but she didn't have all that pink, faulty scripter and everything. So it was kind of weird. So I went back and uh, said, look, we've got to get admitted. So we admitted her. We put a chest tube in, did a CT scan. You can see the middle lobe's kind of okay. It's expanded. The lower lobe's kind of expanded. So what's going on here? So I looked back the, at my videos and and, um, and we said, look, I'm going to take you back in and, and, and see what's going on. So, uh, oh, but before that, when we put the chest tube, there was an early, almost about three, 400 mils uh, uh, per minute. So we took a back for surgery, did a bron bronco intra intra op. And then we, we did a VATS up there for her. We did adhesiolysis. Um, we found there was a raw surface uh, on the superior segment of the, of the lung. We repaired with a proline O. There were some middle lobe adhesions. We took it down and then we, we stapled that part of it. And uh, the stumps were all intact. So here's the video of the pre-op. And uh, I, I, I will tell you why many mistakes I can learn from this video. And, and uh, we look back at this video and. And if you also, this is the surgery, lobectomy done. You can see here, there is a raw space on the superior segment over here. And there was some bubbles, you can see some very mild bubbles. So we thought, ah, uh, you know, there we go, right? And this is the raw surface over here. Okay, so now in my practice right now, I will stitch it, but at that time, I thought, ah, uh, this will resolve. We've seen people put stuff on it and it, and it heal. So that's exactly what I did. I don't know whether I was just lazy or what, but uh, so I put surgery cell snow, patted that area there. And then I sprayed lots and lots of glue, lots and lots of glue. So now look at this photo over here with all this glue here. Now, I've learned this thing. Glue takes about two to three weeks for it to completely dissolve. 
And then the surgery cell snow can be persistent for up to three months over there. Now, for when we have air leaks, what is happens is the air leak component will touch against any tissue around the lung, the chest wall, the medial spinal, and it will form adhesions. And these adhesions will actually seal up and seal the leak. But when you put this much of glue, oh, sorry, when you put this much of glue over um, over the um, the raw surface over here, you know, it takes two weeks for it to dissolve. It takes then another three months for the cell to dissolve. So I don't, that lung component over there really, really, really never, never actually healed. And then, so there's no acquisition of it. So we actually had a false reading because the snow and surgery cell was padding sealed the, the leak, but the lung actually never healed. So this is what happened when we took the patient back after that. Um, Okay, so see, then threw some more surgery cell in there and really padded it all up and thinking, okay, so uh, false sense of security for me that day. And so three months later when we went in, uh, what did we see? So you can see here, all the glue is dissolved, but look at that, there's still some remnant surgery cells still there. All right. And... Um, And what we did was we cleaned up all this uh, old surgery cell that's on it. We swept, out, swept it all off. Maybe there's still maybe some bits of glue, I don't know, three months there. And then we did the leak test and here we go. That part of the lung, remember the raw surface that I showed you all, you can see here, they never healed actually. And imagine if I left it and it stuck to the middle sign and maybe it would have sealed by itself, I don't know. But the best thing you should have done is I should have done this. It takes literally three to five minutes to stitch. And once you stitch it, I probably would have avoided all these problems for her. And so uh, you can see after we stitch it up, there was no more leak. And, uh, and yeah, so that's that. So, um, Post, I mean, this is the pre-op uh, before we took her back the second time x-ray and you can see post-op the lung has uh, expanded uh, quite nicely. Um, Follow-up in clinic, there was some space uh, within, sorry, this thing's popping here, yeah, within two months post-repair. Now there's a hydropneumothorax, but she was again very stable and I was pretty sure I got it all. So I said, look, now we can just wait. You don't have to treat the space now. Wait it out. Um, and this was the x-ray five to six months later, you can see the lung is expanded. We got a CT scan for her. Uh, and and I, literally all the views, there was no space anymore over there. And it kind of, a lot of adhesions have, have probably formed over there. And this is two years post so you can see the lung. So once you know for sure you've got the leak, you've sealed it and you've done all your testing. Uh, and what I want to show you is that post-op, maybe you still got a space there, but this time we were very, very certain that uh, everything, uh, it was probably, it's not gonna recur again. So the second case I wanted to show you is, uh, again, a vet's bullectomy for a pneumothorax case, and we did a pleurectomy for this patient. And uh, this patient actually um, had a constant leak every day. You know, it wasn't healing. It, it actually was that exactly the type E, like how we demonstrated, 100 to 500 mils a day, and he was just sitting in the ward, and the parents didn't want to put a hemorrhoid valve in him. So we said, okay, let's take him back and let's see what... Um, what happened and here we go you can see the, the pleura is all peeled off here and, and uh, there's a constant bubbling over here and you can see that there see there's a, another ruptured bully over here and uh, and none of the, the pleurectomy that I did so the whole lung didn't even the pleurectomy didn't even take basically that or the lung didn't even take to the to the chest wall so and and knowing very well that you know he's getting another small bully rupturing again so what we did do is uh, after the we stapled off that leaking component over there. We then did a um, uh, top to releases for him. Okay, so then we just uh, spray powder away. So um, once the powder is done, this is how it looks like after you put the powder in there. We put a chest tube and we come out and, and uh, post up, it was quite well. Um, the third case, again, one of my most troubling cases I've had to deal with and was so happy that the patient actually went home after many months in hospital. Uh, it's a case of aspergilloma with a 
with a BPF and dealing with these air leaks. So uh, very, very difficult case. Apollo was completely destroyed by the aspergilloma here and had constantly persistent hemoptysis. So we had to go in. And so we did a right thoracotomy and apolobectomy. And again, uh, he had mycetoma, dense adhesions throughout the chest wall. We had to resect the fourth and fifth rib to gain access into the hemithorax. Um, again, we freed up the lung completely uh, uh, and we had to do some extra fluid dissection for that. Uh, the fissures were fused, uh, large bronchial arteries. We divided it with a stapler. Then we did the same thing, PAPV, uh, divided by vascular stapler. Upload bronchus divided by the endostapler. And then we put an intercostal muscle flap on top of the bronchus, thinking that you know we should uh, re-secure it. But here's a good thing. Again, something I'm knocking myself for. Uh, Lola was decorticated then. And then chest wall defect reconstructed with a poorly mesh. Uh, I don't know what in the world I was thinking that in an infected space you go in, uh, <laughs> put a proline mesh to, to, to cover that space. So, uh, so this this uh, whole complication, I don't know whether it's blame the surgeon and, and, and very, very bad decision on my side, but it's something we have to deal with. So unfortunately for him is that it, nothing to do with the mesh now, but uh, literally seven days after surgery, he picks up a bad pneumonia got to be intubated, he had to be thrown, and uh, you know, very bad infection, and we were aggressively treating him with antibiotics, and then suddenly now, uh, pseudomonas was growing from the chest tube tra drainage, and uh, spoke to the ID physician, and even, you know, there's a mesh in there, and that mesh is like, a, you know, that's like a Burger King for pseudomonas, you know, or McDonald's for pseudomonas. So anyway, we uh, got him, Restabilized him, you know, managed to treat him, got him off uh, uh, back up to the ward, and he's actually just sitting there with his chest tube there, just spilling out uh, pus every day uh, from the tube. So after he was very, very stable, we said, Look, and then started to have an air leak. So, son, to have a big air leak on coughing, you can see just bubbles every time he talks and stuff. So, I thought, Okay, let's do a scope of him, what's going on. And then you can see here the upper lobe stump had opened up. Okay, this is the bronchus intermediate, this is the upper lobe stump. So it's completely opened up. And uh, so we went in back in there. So the, the ID physician told me, look, we're never going to treat this if we don't take it out. And one of the most difficult operations I think I went through is to remove this mesh off the lung. And so when we went and got it out, put another flap on the BPF. And uh, post-op, he had this big space over here. And he still had a persistent leak. Uh, and, but we said, look, why don't you go home? and uh, we will come back. I spoke to my respiratory physician and I said, look, if you put the scope in and uh, look look at it, um, the stump is only about five mm in diameter uh, that had opened up. So we said, let's give this a go. I don't know whether it's luck or whether it healed by itself. So we used a bronchoscope, brought him in and put histoacryl glue into the stump space over here. And after six months, you can see the whole thing actually kind of uh, sealed, sealed off uh, by itself. So is it the glue that did the job or maybe it's just the body just self-sealed? I think it's that, but I thought I just wanted to show you all that. Um, one thing I want to teach you all from this complication is that never put a mesh in an infected space. I don't know what I was thinking, but when you have to deal with it, you need to go back and take it out. And then you need to then, and if you get a BPF, you need to go back in and repair. So we did that thing. We put an intercostal flap, um, another flap on it and stuff, muscle flap on it. But that didn't work, and so we used the glue. So eventually, you know, uh, after six months, we kept the chest tube there. There was no more uh, pus coming out from it. We kept the chest tube there, hoping that the, the BPF will seal. And eventually, it sealed off, and we pulled out the chest tube. And this is an X-ray one year after uh, his surgery, and uh, he was very, very well. And so, I just wanted to just show you again the, the hole, the, the BPF hole, and. Um, the glue we injected in, and then at five months is what it looked like. At five point five months, and at six months, uh, that's what it looked like. So we finally see it off. So those are my uh, cases on um, prolonged air leak and how I dealt with it surgically. Uh, the other last two topics I'm going to touch on is subcutaneous emphysema, and this is very very common what we deal with. And it's, sorry, it's not common, but it's a complication we always deal with as thoracic surgeons, and we will definitely encounter it sometime in our, in our career. So what is uh, subcutaneous emphysema? Basically, is air traveling in the subcutaneous plane. 
why does it go there? It's because it's a part of least resistance. And then it, it and how does it get there? It's because when we enter into the chest, we have to cut the pleura, the parietal pleura. And so that disrupts the space between the muscle and the parietal pleura. So there's an exit area for air to go into the subcutane over there. So Robert Sofoyo defined it as a clinically symptomatic subcutane signal is defined as air under the skin. And it is perceptible by the clinician, the patient, a family member, or he has a change in voice. And, um, and uh, you know, why, why does it happen? Basically in lung, lung resections, again, like I mentioned to you, we, we cut the pleura. And so most of the time, the air you should come up through the chest tube. But if the chest tube is blocked, um, uh, or the leak is so big that the tube actually cannot drain the air out fast enough, it will then to track under the, the, the subject thing. Okay, and of course, you get these other things called recalcitrant, recalcitrant subcutaneous emphysema is when uh, that part that is leaking forms adhesions with the broken part of the pleura. So it has a direct communication with the, with the subcute plane. So it's actually not going to exit out from your chest tube. It's going to go straight into the subcute plane straight away. So no matter how many chest tubes you put inside, you're not going to drain it because it's formed its own fistula over there. And so those are what we call recalcitrant subcutaneous emphysema. So the, the normal stuff we see are like x-rays like this and I'm usually not too concerned about, but you know, when you see something like this or you, you do a CT scan, I mean, this, this is definitely very, very worrying uh, for all of us and how do we manage it. Um, when I looked up again, some papers, actually there's not much out there on any uh, um, big papers talking about subcutaneous emphysema, but uh, this was published in the Indian Journal, I think in 2013. And uh, one thing this group did from Iran is that they, they graded the, the uh, subcute emphysema, but there's, but there's no other study that has um, done this. And I think it's something that you can work on if you want to uh, look at it. But I think what is worrying we always see is the grade four and grade five that is uh, troublesome. And so, you know, this is a common feature, right? This is really bad. When it comes to this level, even, this, even the, the surgeon tends to get a bit worried. And, uh, and then you, when they get the change of voice and it becomes like they start helium and they start talking like that, you, you tend to need to do something. So, so this is a, if you go to YouTube and you type uh, subcutaneous emphysema surgical incision on skin, it's a very nice video on YouTube in, in the UK, they did that. And, uh, and you can see when they cut the skin and they ask the patient to breathe, you can actually, and they, sorry, and they milk the, the skin, you can actually see bubbles coming out from the tube. But, I have never done this, and I don't know whether this is still commonly practiced. Um, I think it's a uh, very morbid to do, but uh, you know, what are your options? Basically, is uh, number one is you can observe the patient, but if it's coming to that level, you don't. Uh, you can increase the suction. Is what you can commonly do. The first thing you do. Number two is you put another chest tube inside, and if the lung is expanded fully, and and uh, and you got a subcute emphysema building up please get a CT scan because then it's probably a loculated uh, uh, pneumothorax that you cannot tackle. I, I've had a patient, I tried to look for the x-ray, I can't find it, where the x-ray showed the lung was fully expanded, it looked good. But when we did a CT scan, he had a huge pneumothorax posteriorly because when they're doing an x-ray in the ward, they're doing an AP. So anteriorly, it looks very well expanded, but actually posteriorly, uh, there's a big pneumothorax building up over there. So I generally will get a CT scan for this patient. Or you can do a lateral x-ray if you want. And of course, this incision, I put a question mark there because I, I, I'm not a fan of this. And of course, surgery. So again, Robert Sofolio, uh, he, he, in fact, actually, surprisingly, he actually talked, used the word single bed incision in 1998. And uh, he did this for, he had uh, how many patients? 64 patients who had uh, recalcitrant, um, subcute emphysema and what he showed is he he went in early within seven days and he made an incision above his thoracotomy incision and he put a scope inside and then he found whatever he felt that the adhesions were directly connected to the subcutaneous so like like i mentioned to you, the alveolar subcutaneous fistula and he just put broke all the adhesions that's it and he put the chest tube inside and in his report he said 63 out of 64 of his patients the subcute had resolved in 24 hours I don't know whether it disappeared, but I think probably it didn't progress. Uh, but this is what his conclusion was. So, you know, that's one way you can do. So in my practice, uh, for subcute emphysema, what we do is I get a chest x-ray to see if there's a pneumothorax. 
uh, check if the chest tube is blocked and make sure I milk the chest tube. And if the pneumothorax is persistent, put one more drain in straight away. If there's no pneumothorax or the lung it looks expanded on x-ray, I always get a CT thorax and I get a percute another drain in um, and put it on suction. So the last thing I want to uh, talk about is uh, other causes of residual space. And, and again, we deal with this commonly in our practice. And um, most of the time is because of the compliance of the lung. And so the lung basically has lost its elastic recoil. And you see this all in the chronic emphysema patients where the lung can't really expand. And so you will get a persistent space over here. And uh, you know, the causes are age, TB, infection, fibrotic changes, or if you have a concomitant to an infection over here. So this is an example of a patient who uh, had a secondary pneumothorax and considered doing like an LDRS, a large bullet on top, we resected it. And you can see at a big post-operative leak. And so we put, we preempted by putting two chest tubes inside. And the lung, even this, I think was even with suction, the lung didn't come up at all. Uh, but we just hung in there. Uh, we followed the basic guidelines to stop the suction. We made sure the subcute didn't build up. We sent him back on the hemming valve and post-operative, uh, after a few weeks later, this is what his x-ray looks like and he was quite well. Another thing is you always get this, I'm sure in, in, uh, in India, that you definitely have a lot of mycetoma that we deal with. So I think for you, this is a, for you all, this is probably very common. And you always get after because of the poor lung compliance or if you don't defaulticate properly the lung, you're going to have this thing called a fixed plural uh, space or fixed plural defect. And, uh, you know, I'm genuinely never too concerned with this. Even you see the CT scan. So the CT scan was ordered by one of my registrars worrying that there is something happening there. But uh, it's good to, to tell you that, look, it's fine, you know. There will be a space and you've got to accept it that it's going to be a chronic space. The last part I'm going to go to is that uh, if you are concerned of that space, what do you do? I know this is not part of the complications talk, but I thought just to touch on it a little bit. The goal of any surgery basically is to eliminate total space in thoracic surgery. And you can do many things in drop to preemptive yourself. So the first thing you can do is to, something very easy to do is tenting of the parotid pleura. Of course, you need to decorticate the pleura. You can also use muscle flaps to put in there. Or one thing I've learned is this diaphragmatic elevation. So people used to crush the diaphragm, and I think that's very, very wrong, but that causes permanent damage of it. But you can actually inject some lignocaine into that to cause temporary paralysis, and that pushes the diaphragm up, and it kind of opposes the whole lung to the chest wall. Give it some time, and then eventually the diaphragm will regain its space after one or two days. And that really reduces your post-operative early And unfortunately, I actually have done only one case like that for, uh, for um, secondary pneumothorax, and it worked brilliantly. So I wish I had that video, but I'll look for it and next time I'll send it to you all. So plural tenting basically is to bring the pleura down and uh, this facilitates the lung re-expansion. So you, basically you, you bring the lung, you bring the pleura to the lung. So the lung doesn't have to come to the pleura. So, uh, an example of this is, this is actually not a plural denting, but this is actually a pleurectomy. But the concept is similar. So when you open up, when you open up, uh, and this is the pleura, this is a true bad sensation. And you can see here, so what you, this is the pleura over here. Just jump it a bit. Uh, I usually use my, my I usually use my finger just to manually dissect the, the, the pleura away from the endothoracic fascia first. Okay, so, so you can see that we've pushed the, sorry, my series is going haywire again. Okay. Um, yeah, so here we go. So uh, what I do is after I push that part down and I got some space over here, I will then inject um, lignocaine into that space. And this also helps to separate the, the pleura away from the endothoracic fascia, so it makes it easier to feel. So you do that a few times. And uh, you can then take your ring forceps or anything you can do, and you can, you can peel the pleura down. Uh, this is actually a pleurectomy video, but the concept is very, very similar. So same thing, you pull, you're, 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 you're peeling the pleura down away from the endothoracic fascia. And eventually, uh, what you want to do is you don't want to break the pleura, but even if it breaks a little bit, it's okay. Uh, sorry.
So even if breaks away, but the idea is, I see you want to bring it down towards the, uh, the lung area like that. So you can see here, if I just press pause. Okay, see here. So most of the pleura has come down over here. So this is like a tenting you can actually do. And then this will actually help to bring the lung closer to the, to the pleural space. So post-op x-ray kind of looks like this uh, when you're done with it. And, um, and, and, and that's one way to actually reduce your risk of post-operative leaks. A decortication, I think, is quite standard. I won't go too much into it. Muscle flaps, again, I won't go too much into it. Uh, but you know we can use in the costal flaps, but the best flaps are actually straightest anterior flaps or the left door side flaps when you put it in. Now, if you're not very good at it and it's your first time doing it, get your plastic surgeon colleagues to come and give you a helping hand uh, because they are very good. But very important is if you're going to do a thoracotomy, don't cut the muscle. And that's very dangerous. And then you lose the, the, uh, the vascular supply to it. So it's very, very important. Uh, Dr. Rocco, you know, has a very good um, article on uh, a few of uh, procedures he's done and uh, how he's done it and his outcomes. And um, you can see here, these are the scans of after the muscle flap was placed inside in the X-ray. Okay, so the last thing is like I told you about the elevation of the diaphragm. Again, I'm just gonna jump through it. Uh, the idea is basically is that you want to just numb the phrenic nerve to get the diaphragm to elevate up and that pushes the whole lung up. So I've actually used one to two mils of directly injecting around, not into the nerve, but around the nerve area and paralyze the, the nerve and that causes it to go up. I will never ever recommend you to grab the nerve or crush the nerve because that causes a permanent damage. So try to not handle nerve as much as you can. Uh, an article here from uh, Switzerland, if I'm not mistaken, what they did was they identified the phrenic nerve in the neck and they injected uh, uh, local anesthesia to it. And you can see a patient had a prolonged air leak and a basal pneumothorax. And after they injected it there, the diaphragm elevated and uh, it kind of um, did a continuous block over there. And after a few days, they could remove the, the tube for the patient and the, the, the diaphragm regained its uh, function after a few weeks, uh, a few days later. Another, what are some other papers have written out is they've injected pneumoperitoneum, and this is a bit more aggressive, uh, where they place air under the diaphragm and like this, and they cause the um, diaphragm to elevate. And some of them, uh, some injected just one shot, two liters in. Some people actually put it into a valve kind of a system over here, and they continuously injected flow into it to get the diaphragm to elevate. Over there. So, there are many tips of uh, the tricks you can do, but I think as thoracic surgeons, this maybe is a little bit too interventional, but you can give it a go. And uh, But these are just reports from certain centers. So the last one I wanted to come to is I wanted to show you a complication where it's bad, but it's salvageable. But what happened after that complication is something that is very problematic to deal with in the sense that uh, from a from a um, administration point of view, so we had a thymoma over here. She had some effusion, but it was all okay. So this is a uh, what I did was try to do it again my early days uh, and try to do it through a vets incision. And so she's a non myasthenic um, uh, patient. So we thought, okay, let's let's just resect the thymoma and uh, just jump through the video of the thymoma resection. So. So we took the thymoma out and, you know, and so the guidelines may say if it's a thymoma, you should do a thymectomy after that. Um, I've actually just looked at some meta-analysis on it and we've written it, but here comes the point. So we decided anyway to continue to just free up the whole thymus gland. So here we are trying to get, here we are trying to get to the superior pole and, um, and we put a, just put a clip there temporarily. Uh, and then using the ligature, we burn it. And this is what happened next. Okay, so, you know, big bleed. Uh, so first thing to do is re-grab it. And again, uh, pack it, pressure and weight. But after multiple times of packing and trying to see packing fancy, we finally discovered this is the normal vein that we buggered and uh, that I buggered. And I thought, okay, look, you know, um, 
what do we do next? So we put some pressure on it and uh, we did a median snorkeling for the patient. And what we found out is that the more we kept on pressing, this vein is very, very fragile. The more we kept on packing, the more we kept on tearing it more and more and more. So eventually we ligated the normal vein and we came out and the patient was okay. But the first thing I did at my level here was I called my senior to come in to help me very quickly. So it's very important to do that. Um, and uh, always, even at a very senior level, when you have this kind of bleed, there's nothing wrong with calling in someone to help you. So anyway, we did that. But um, post-op x-ray, can anybody see what's going on over here? Patient's very well. I'll point it out to you. What's this guy over here? There's a gauze left behind. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and, and if anything you do, if you leave a gauze behind, it goes all the way up to the main street, straight away. And it becomes a hospital uh, issue and everything like that. So it's a big thing to do with patient. It was great. Family was fine. We didn't know where it was. So we just put a, got an eye eye when we put the patient on the table. I just put a ring forceps over there and did it through a bath and just pull it out. The patient did extremely well. She went home literally after five days and everything was great. But that complication is something that I hope no one has to ever encounter because it is... Uh, difficult to deal with from a from an emotional standpoint of view and also from a, from a, from a hospital standpoint of view. Um, before I conclude my talk is that I wanted to tell you all about uh, a medical um, um, ethics course that was in Singapore uh, and there was a, a senior resident or senior registrar in Australia, a gynecology senior registrar in Australia uh, and he came and gave a talk on no-fault error reporting. He was actually a fighter pilot for 15 years. And he used to be a fighter pilot trainer in the British Armed Forces. And uh, he's, now he was a senior gynecology trainee in uh, Australia at the time. And um, what he did was he, he, he said that as a fighter pilot, a lot of times you go up there in the air, you make these mistakes, you almost crash the plane, then you land the plane and you tell everybody what happened. Uh, so it's something called no fault reporting. You're not going to fault you for it, but it's very educational. So what we can do with this no fault reporting is basically that um, you know the errors that are trapped basically in our operations are unlikely to be detected because we can do that. We don't present our data. We just go home and say, okay, I had no complications. Everything is good. But I think it's important that we actually start presenting this uh, commonly because what happens is that if when you, if for the first time you are having an error. Like he told me, he said he put a hysteroscope into the uterus and suddenly he was in the bowel. And then he said, oh my God, what to do? And then when he went back to the, to the tea room and when he was talking with his other senior colleagues, they're like, oh, this is the first time happening to you, is it? So, you know, you can, if you don't report this and you don't talk about it with your colleagues and stuff, you know, you can go down in flames. Or, or really, basically, if you can report it and you discuss it and you talk about it, you literally can, you know, avoid or even when you're getting shot at or when you're having these complications, you can still keep the plane alive or keep the patient alive. And that's very important to share information. So, you know, very important basically with this no fault error reporting is that we should always find a root cause behind the errors and not establish blame or liability. Uh, I think uh, it's uh, very important for us to have no non-primitive approach and that actually stimulates us to go out there and, and, uh, and share our experiences with, with people. So a wise surgeon once said, if you haven't got any complications, you haven't done enough. Um, and I like uh, Atul Gawande from his book, Complications. I think all of us should read this book. And one of his quotes was, uh, if we want perfection without, we want perfection without practice, yet everyone is harmed if no one is trained for the future. So you must actually you know, speak about complications, treat about how you, how you um, encounter it and how you overcome it or how you didn't or, or overcome it and discuss it and never be shy about it. So with that, I'd like to conclude my uh, talk for today. Thank you very much, Harish. Uh, my respect for you has gone up three folds uh, because this was the most honest presentation that I've ever come across. Uh, thank you very much for addressing the young surgeons on this forum w with a genuine presentation. You know, you have been, you've put your heart and soul into it. And, and you've really been very honest and you've put it out for all of us to see. Uh, when I gave you this topic, uh, I think it took you at least two to three weeks uh, to prepare this presentation. Yeah, yeah. And, and, it is, and it is obvious, it is obvious. I can see the 
the effort that you've put into this presentation. So hats off yeah. to you. And, yeah, and a you. sincere thank you from all these juniors uh, because you have really brought up some very important issues uh, around uh, surgery and being a good surgeon. So I, I, there are a few comments I'd like to make before we start taking any question and answers. So the first uh, point is your last or second last slide where you spoke about uh, uh, no fault reporting. Uh, no can, fault can, error can, you, can you still see my slides or is- Yes, uh, we can, yes, we can. Okay. So right. no fault error reporting is an extremely important concept. It is absolutely part of your uh, training and it is part of your everyday duty. In the UK, this, the word that is used is duty of candor. Please do not forget this. Please write this down and Google it. Is D-U-T-Y, duty of candor, C-A-N-D-O-U-R. And it is an integral part of risk management. And, and duty of candor states that whatever happens, you have to have a sign out and you have to identify what went wrong what went well, and most important in no fault error reporting is that you must tell the patient what happened. It's not just about telling your colleague what happened, but the patient has to be informed about what happened and you have to document that you have actually told the patient what happened. So sometimes you know we think small things and we just say, ah, it's okay, but it's not okay. Whether the patient is affected or not affected, and, and I'll tell you, when you tell the patient what happens, 99% of patients actually respect, for, respect you for it. And medical complaints go down. There is a paper which has looked at this. And there is a direct correlation between the honesty and the openness of the surgeon to uh, decrease in medical complaints. Nobody minds it if things go wrong. Uh, as long as they feel that the surgeon has been honest and is on their side. You agree, Harish, on that? Absolutely. I think without a doubt, from, from the beginning, when the patient comes to your clinic to the day they leave, if you tell them the truth about everything, they have nothing to blame you. But at the moment you try to hide something and something comes out, you immediately lose faith in you straight away. And that's when and the I, losses start to come. Yeah, And the important thing is the patient always knows when you're trying to hide. Yeah. That's the reality. I mean, if you think that the patient is foolish, I think you are mistaken. 99% yeah. of patients will know when you try to hide something. So don't think that the patient doesn't know. So it's always better to sit down with the patient and also more important to sit down with the family and, and discuss all these issues. So that's a very, very good uh, presentation which Harish has given us, which has given us clarity about how you should talk about your uh, mistakes and how you must talk to patients. Excellent, Harish, excellent. Now, a couple of points I want to make. I, I, I liked your slides on subcutaneous emphysema, and I like the fact that you showed us a YouTube video, but for the young people of this group, and Harish mentioned quite clearly as well, there is no role, and I repeat, there is no role for surgical incisions on the chest wall or for subcutaneous uh, chest tubes or, uh, you know, number 21 French needle. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I've seen that. The it's hilarious. There is it's hilarious, no role. Actually. Yeah. If you've got surgical emphysema, you have to get to the root cause. And the root cause is always lung. And so it is the plural space that you have to drain. And he very clearly pointed out that the one reason why you're getting the surgical emphysema is because your drain is not able to handle the amount of air leak that is coming out. So the answer is either you increase your suction or you put in a second drain. Do not, do not put in cuts on your chest wall. You will cause infection and you will end up with an empyema. That's the worst thing to do for the patient. The only person you're treating by making surgical incisions on the skin is the surgeon. That's it. You are treating the surgeon. You're treating the surgeon's anxiety, not the root cause of the problem. So very, very, very important point. And I like uh, the way he showed it as well. The second point I want to make about bleeding is, uh, uh, remember when, you know, most of the times we do the work and then we walk away and usually the registrar or a junior surgeon closes the chest. 
So this message is for the registrar and junior surgeons. Imagine in your brain, what is one ml and two ml of blood? Okay, just, just imagine, what do you think is two ml of blood? Now, two ml of blood is probably one drop of blood. Agreed. It's probably one proper drop of blood. But if you look at, at leakage from an intercostal artery of two ml per second, then over an hour, it's 120 ml per hour. Do you realize that it's 120 ml per hour? And if you multiply 120 by 24 hours, then it is a liter or liter and a half, okay? Or more probably, two and a half liters because 24 by 120 is whatever. So the real key to bleeding is the intercostal artery. Everything else stops. The pulmonary, the lung surface stops. Pulmonary artery, if it bleeds, it's a massive bleed, a small ooze always stops. But it is the chest wall, which is the main problem uh, for post-operative bleeding. And if you do not stop an intercostal artery from leaking, particularly a partially torn intercostal artery, then it doesn't go into spasm and doesn't stop. It continues to ooze, it continues to drip. And as I told you, just one or two ml a second is equal to 120 ml an hour. It's, it's just a very simple concept. And so anybody who's closing the chest, if you see a leak coming from the chest wall, particularly if you're doing it by vats, you can actually visualize it. Please put in a Liger clip or just buzz it off. You must stop that bleed because most of the times when we go back in, we don't find a source of bleeder. And then you see, you know, it's usually the apex of the chest wall, which is dripping gently. And then it's such a pain to go back in. It's a big setback for the patient. As Harish said, a mortality from a wax lobectomy or a standard lobectomy is 1%. 1% to 3% is an international uh, quoted number, but most of us who are doing a lot of it is 1%. And a mortality from a re-exploration for bleeding is 10%. 10% mortality. Can you imagine what happens? What happens is when you've got bleeding, you are completely upsetting the hemostasis and the physiological coagulation cascade. And then you get into the a very bad uh, cycle of, of bleeding and more bleeding and the blood products going in and the coagulation products going in. So at the time of closure, you must make sure that the chest wall is not bleeding. And also look at the pores. Most of the bleeding happens from the pores rather than from the adhesion. And you, you didn't look carefully, you just said, ah, it's all okay, and you went back. So one ml or two ml per second is, the message I want to get across. Most of the bleeding is from the chest wall. If it's from PA and all that, that's a different scenario. That, you know, we, we can't control that. That happens and shit happens. But the chest wall, we can prevent. And so very important to understand that. And the third point, which I want to make, Harish, is it okay? I'm just trying to sort of, uh, you no, know, get a few go, points. Go, go, uh, go, for it. go for it. I think this is important. Yeah. The third most important point I want to share with all my colleagues is, if you think of re-exploring, you must do it. That has been my experience. If the thought has crossed your mind that maybe I should go back to theater, do not look back. Because waiting for four hours, six hours, eight hours, 10 hours does not make the patient better. So, you know, with experience, almost all of us have realized then when the thought of going back in comes to your mind, if my registrar calls me on the phone and says, you know what, sir, I think we should go back. For me, that is the warning sign. And I will immediately try to put things into motion. I'll come and see the patient, but my threshold goes down. No matter who is in the team, as long as it's a decently experienced guy, if the thought of reopening go comes into your mind, very little to gain by pushing time only thing that will happen is you lose more volume and you'll end up giving a lot more blood and, and your results will get skewed. And so that's why I always tell my juniors, if, you, if you're worried and if you think it needs to be reopened, phone me and I will give you permission to start going to theater and I'll get into the car and come. 
always this has been my experience over the years do, do you agree harish in the in my third absolutely. point absolutely 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 yeah very 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 important that if you think of re-exploring then just just go and do it and do it by vats you don't have to do a thoracotomy mm. you know if you've done it by vats all you need is a camera in i'll tell you the advantage of re-exploration is when you suck all the blood out and you wash the whole cavity even if you don't find a bleeder just by sucking all the blood out and cleaning it with uh, you know saline hydrogen peroxide betadine whatever else that you do you actually help the coagulation cascade and and you know there is very difficult to prove it scientifically but most of us have seen that you don't find a bleeder but just because you washed it all out the patient starts to feel better and your chest x ray looks fine and your chest drain uh, you know there's a reduction in the amount of blood coming out so very 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 important okay uh, i i love the fact that harish you brought up uh, the concept of herbal medicine uh, yeah it's such an important point never realized it never struck my mind that uh, there is so much data saying that these cause uh, antiplatelet action oh, clinically I, i have dealt with this it's ridiculous they just ooze you know yeah yeah i didn't realize that they were so important but you are right you're absolutely right and the other point i want to make is i personally in my practice do not stop aspirin i'm quite happy to operate with aspirin because i feel that the guy is going to die because of a heart attack he's never going to die because of uh, oozing so that's why anybody who's got a stent who's got cardiac surgery in the past or whatever i'll stop clopidogrel i will stop warfarin but aspirin i say continue till the time of the surgery because we can control aspirin pretty easily on table by being careful and doing your dissection carefully so i i try to take care of the heart quite quite aggressively because my philosophy is you you don't die because of 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 oozing but you definitely die if you get an mi on table the last thing i want is a stent to go down so excellent excellent anybody has got any questions to ask uh, another question which was raised in the group was uh, you said early in your lecture that uh, for you uh, the x ray has to the ct scan has to be uh, at least 3 months uh, old uh, and people immediately started writing about that uh, in in our clinical practice 4 uh, weeks is what we tolerate Uh, unless unless it's a it's a benign pathology like an aspergilloma or something like that but if you're doing lung cancer then 4 weeks is what we want uh, for the ct scan we don't want it to be later than that maximum 6 weeks but most of the times 4 weeks is my cut off uh, but that's okay that's individual practices uh, how do you manage torsion harish when you oh, so stop i i had a, a brilliant uh... A patient and an X-ray. I I wanted to put that in, but I thought the talk's getting too long. So I had a, a which I managed from another colleague. Um, he had a middle lobe torsion. This patient, so patient had upper yep. lobe back to me, had a middle lobe torsion. Post op day four or five, started having a bit of hemoptysis. Mm -hmm. uh, offered this patient to go back in because there's risk of gangrene and stuff like that. And the uh, patient said, No, I don't want any more things. so we actually left it alone and patient was fine <laughs> you know and uh, surprisingly i mean the re the, the reality is that the lung should die and believe it or not 3 years later she got a recurrence of cancer in the lower lobe uh and it was a uh, so we decide discuss the tumor board is it going and do a uh, remove the lobe lobe so we have to do a pneumonectomy anyway so when we went in back in that this one i went in to do the the lower lobe is completely your middle lobe is completely gone there's like nothing left there was just a thin piece of fiber there you know uh, of course everything was stuck down but when we tried to really look for the lower lobe and try to define it we couldn't so i mean for any torsion i would go back in straight away i mean there's no doubt about it but i just wanted to show this case but i thought oh it's a bit too long or my question too long so uh, this one but torsion i would go in On, on table do you fix your uh, middle lobe no i i i i tried that once and i got a bad post op adding an epicentral station so jenny when i get them to inflate the lung i will put the scope look properly and make sure it's going in the right direction and if it's going in the right direction i just i don't do it i i i've never fixed the, the middle lobe have you ever tried bronchoscopic uh, technique to relieve the torsion 
no, I, like I said, I've only had to deal with one torsion case, and that was a, a patient which. So, so one of the options available to you when you've got post-op torsion, or or suggestion that you've got torsion, is to do a bronchoscopy, and suction it out really well, and then get your bronchoscope into the uh, middle lobe bronchus and try to you know suck it all out so that. It, uh, it may anatomy, it may work. It has worked in the past in a couple of patients I've seen it being done. Uh, but torsion is, is, is a real problem. And usually to, with torsion, you need to reoperate. The problem is the moment you have torsion, then you've got gangrene. And, and gangrene then causes sepsis. And that, you know, you were lucky to get away with your patient who had torsion and fibrosis. But tissue lying there with, with pus in it uh, becomes, uh, uh, makes the yeah. patient systemically unwell. And so that's why you should uh, look to operate, as, as he said correctly. Anybody's got any other questions to ask to Harish? I mean, it's just an amazing lecture. Beautiful, Harish, beautiful. Any, any other questions you've got to ask, guys? Oh, you, you must have done a very good job. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, excellent. I, I really enjoyed it. And beautiful cases you brought up. And, uh, this is going to add value to the to the thoracic guru's uh, youtube channel excellent you. so, yeah we we we've, we've had about 21 people logged in today on this platform and Thank another uh, 13 14 on the youtube platform and i haven't seen the international response just as yet so we had about 40 50 people so excellent Wonderful. and then of course people are following up these videos on youtube a lot of people are not uh, watching them live, but they are yes. following them up on YouTube. Yes. Uh, Harish, congratulations. We have had 25,000 views now. On, on I know. Well done. Series. So we have Congrats. crossed the 25,000. I'm serious. 25,000 across 50 countries. That's, uh, <laughs> I got that's all amazing. the feedback. And so it's just, uh, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I didn't even. 25,000 thoracic surgeons. So absolutely. That... I didn't even know there were 25,000 thoracic surgeons in the world, but uh, yeah. we have got 25,000. We have crossed 25,000 now. Well, Till two days ago, well, we were at 25,563, but today we have gone beyond 25,000. So well brilliant. done to all of us. And well I even di uh, directed my residents to say, hey, you, you want yeah. to get a thorough. Uh, no need to go to class, just go to YouTube to us, it grows and you get a whole lecture there, you know, so. Yeah, it's really, uh, really it's nice. amazing. amazing experience, actually. And thanks to everybody who has been, yeah. who has, A, taught on this program, and more importantly, the training. Support, yeah, the support, yeah. They have come to the forum and they have, uh, you know, seek knowledge and it was just amazing. So thank you very much to everybody. Yes. All right. Well thanks very much. Uh, we'll call it a day. It's getting late for you in Singapore. Yes. I'm pretty certain it's past midnight. Yes. Uh, so, so thank you to everybody and thanks, uh, Harish. Appreciate your. Very welcome. Okay, take care. Bye bye. Okay.